The origin of 1 Thessalonians is dated by scholars to circa 50 common era, but I will argue that it is much older. It therefore represents, along with Galatians, one of the earliest Christian documents we know of. Parts of 1 Thessalonians are extant in two papyrus fragments from Papyrus 46, dated to circa 200 common era. The oldest complete version is in the Codex Sinaiticus circa 330 to 360. Therefore, the oldest extant copy we have, which is two small fragments, was written some 150 years after the original, assuming the accepted dates for the original are correct. There is then a gap of a further 130 to 160 years between the oldest fragment copy and the oldest full text document. We cannot therefore be certain of the exact content of the original text, since in the 280 plus years from the original to the first full text extant copy, much could have been omitted, amended or added, either unintentionally by human error, or intentionally with a view to changing the meaning of certain parts of the author's overriding message. But for analysis purposes, we can only work with the documents in the form in which we have them today. The letter is from Paul, Silvanus and Timothy and is addressed to the Church of the Thessalonians. The Church is described as the Church of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul refers to the good news that he delivers to the Church. The Greek word evangelio translates directly into good news but this is now always translated as gospel. Modern translations read as our gospel came to you not only in word but also in the power of the Holy Spirit. With the term good news evolving over time to mean gospel and the term gospel evolving over time to mean the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John which tell the story of the Jesus from scenario A we have to be mindful of how we interpret what Paul is saying. The gospel of Mark, the oldest of the four canonical gospels did not exist until after 70 common era. Paul is said to have written 1 Thessalonians circa 50 common era but much earlier in my view which will be explained later. So the gospel in the modern sense of the term is not what Paul refers to here. Paul simply means the good news I have about Jesus which he claims he received directly from Jesus by way of an apparition. It is noteworthy that Paul has used the terms God, the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in the opening of his letter and he makes no attempt to unite the three. It would appear from the manner in which Paul introduces them that he views them as three separate and unique theological entities. The Trinity would then seem to be something of an idea that evolved rather than an idea that comes from early Christian thought. Paul then speaks of the widespread acknowledgement and acceptance of the church in Thessalonica and what it worships. He states that they are known in Macedonia, Achaia and beyond. Macedonia, Achaia and beyond would encompass all of Greece as we know it today. And this intrigues me. The letter is said to have been written circa 50 and the scenario A Jesus character is purported to have been executed circa 30. This gives a gap of only 20 years between the purported execution of a seditious preacher in Jerusalem and a church in Thessalonica that worships this execution and has become known for doing so throughout all of Greece. The execution of the seditious preacher would then also be known throughout all of Greece a mere 20 years after the supposed execution. In point of fact it would have been less than 20 years since in the letter Paul indicates that he had previously visited the church at Thessalonica prior to writing and had visited Philippi prior to that. The distance on foot between Jerusalem and Thessalonica is approximately one and a half thousand miles. For the modes of travel, opportunity to travel and methods of communication available in the time period we are reviewing, this time frame of transmission, given the magnitude of transmission, seems far too short for scenario A. But for scenario B, the time frame issue does not exist and therefore does not pose any cause for concern with regard to Paul's statement. If Paul is talking about a mythical Jesus whose sacrifice is metaphorical and from antiquity, the ideology can take as long as it needs to travel or transmit over the large geographical area described. Further, 
It does not rely on being transmitted from a central point, being the location of an execution at a specific date, to the geographical location of the churches, since there is no central point or specific date for the idea to travel out from in scenario B. Now contrast this information with the theological documents found hidden at Qumran. Qumran was destroyed in the culmination of the four to five year Roman Jewish war that ended in 70 Common Era. In the 1940s and 50s many thousands of document fragments were found in clay jars hidden in the caves surrounding Qumran. The fragments have been sorted into more than 900 separate theological manuscripts not one of the manuscripts mentions a Jesus character, scenario A or B. However, Dead Sea Scroll 4Q521, Fragment 2 and Fragment 3 do speak of waiting for a Messiah and waiting for the Teacher of Righteousness to arrive. This means, as at 70 Common Era, the people of Qumran are still waiting for the Messiah to arrive. And, as at 70 Common Era, the people of Qumran are not aware of the purported arrival of the supposed scenario A Jesus 40 years earlier in Jerusalem, a mere 14 miles west of Qumran. If we are to accept that Paul speaks of the Jesus from scenario A, we then have to entertain the unlikely proposition that this Jesus' legacy travelled more than 1,500 miles and populated the entire area of modern day Greece in less than 20 years while at the same time, the same legacy did not manage to travel a mere 14 miles east to Qumran in over 40 years. And a poignant fact here is, Qumran was destroyed before the Jesus story in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John was written. Hence the scribes at Qumran do not know of the story. This adds considerable weight to the suggestion that it was the temple destruction in 70 Common Era that was the raison d'etre for the Jesus story in the first instance and why Paul himself knows nothing of the scenario a Jesus. In chapter 2 verses 13 to 16 Paul states that there are, at the time of writing, churches of God in Jesus Christ in Judea and he states that the Jews killed the prophets and Jesus. Now this is strange because in a later letter, 1 Corinthians, Paul claims only that Jesus was killed by the rulers of this age. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. The word translated to age is in fact aeonos, which translates directly to eternity from the root of eon. And Eon, in the theological sense, in the time period of the start of the first century, had a different textual meaning to the term age today. Eon referred to one of two concepts. There was the understanding of an astrological epoch or age. At the time Paul wrote his letter, the earth had recently, within the last 100 years or so, moved out of the age of Aries and into the age of Pisces, astrologically speaking and an astrological age, eon or epoch, lasted for around 2100 to 2160 years. Eon also had a second theological meaning, especially to the Jews. They saw the world as having two distinct, mutually exclusive ages or eons. There was the present age, here on earth, ruled by the evil ones, and the age to come, in the kingdom of heaven. So when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2.8, None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He is not referring to the leaders in charge in his present time frame, but rather past leaders from the present eon stroke eternity, which has lasted since the creation of the earth. There is a further Gnostic slant on this understanding of eon that will be examined later. If we accept current dating, given that Paul is said to have written 1 Corinthians in 53-54 to Common Era, it seems out of place that he should write in 1 Thessalonians in 50 Common Era, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same thing those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and also drove us out. This is very much talking about the rulers of the present day, as in, the Jews who persecuted Paul and his brethren are the same Jews who killed Jesus. 
why would Paul be so specific here writing in 50 common era and then be so ambiguous and mythically theological three to four years later when writing about the same thing the death of Jesus this is suspicious therefore is the entry about the Jews killing Jesus in 1 Thessalonians a post 70 common era interpolation many New Testament scholars believe so the P46 documents do not contain the pages that would be expected to include chapter 2 verses 13 to 16 P46 has only two non-sequential leaves containing some of the text from 1 Thessalonians. The first time we see chapter 2 in full is in the Codex Sinaiticus written circa 330 to 360. This is 280 to 310 years after the original document was written and more notably after the enforced conversion upon the Roman world to Catholic Christian belief by Constantine and his successors. There is plenty of scope and theological motive for amendments, deletions and insertions to have happened in order to suit the theocratic landscape of the early 4th century Roman world. Of course, it can be asserted that claiming 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13 to 16 to be a later interpolation is beneficial to the Scenario B case and therefore very easy and convenient for the mythicists to claim. But it is not the mythicists making the claim it is a significant number of the theological alumni who put the case. The evidence put forward for a post-70 common era interpolation is quite strong and post-70 common era does not have to mean just after 70 common era. Post-Council of Nicaea in 325 common era is also post-70 common era and also pre-Codax Sinaiticus. The exact text of the four verses being disputed is and so we too constantly thank God that when you received God's message that you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human message, but as it truly is, God's message, which is at work among you who believe. For you became imitators, brothers and sisters, of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, because you too suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they in fact did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us severely. They are displeasing to God and are opposed to all people because they hinder us from speaking to the Gentiles so they may be saved. Thus they constantly fill up their measure of sin but wrath hath come upon them completely. So, in addition to the information already highlighted about the absence of a Scenario A or Scenario B Jesus character in the documents found at Qumran and the use of the term rulers of this eon rather than the Jews of the present day in 1 Corinthians we also have an argument of interpolation in that these four verses disrupt the flow of the document and the flow seems to be restored if we read from verse 12 straight to verse 17. As you know, we dealt with each one of you like a father with his children, urging and encouraging you and pleading that you lead a life worthy of God who calls into you his own kingdom and glory. As for us, brothers and sisters, when for a short time we were made orphans by being separated from you, in person, not in heart, we longed with great eagerness to see you face to face. Another argument for interpolation is that the reference that the Jews killed Lord Jesus is a claim made nowhere else in the works of Paul. But the biggest clue comes in the last verse, 2.16. As a punishment to the Jews for killing Jesus and persecuting his followers, the wrath of God has come upon them completely. This is seen as a strong reference to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 common era, but the letter is dated by scholars to 50 common era. So to mention the complete wrath of God, if it is the destruction of the temple in this verse, and it does sound like it involves destruction of a significant nature, the verse must be a later post-70 common era interpolation. I would concur with these arguments. They do seem very strong evidence of interpolation for these four verses. And of course, this would raise an important question that needs to be addressed. Hypothesizing that the interpolation argument is valid, why did the scribe feel the need to make the interpolation? It would not be an error, it would be an intentionally deceitful act.
I would contend that the interpolation was made in order to leave a falsified statement in the historic record that could be used to dishonestly add weight and evidence to a scenario a Jesus where such evidence was scant or non-existent. This would be a symptom of a scenario B Jesus being the reality. The last chapter, chapter 5, has a restated message about the coming wrath of God and how to avoid it. Paul informs his brethren that the coming wrath is imminent and it will be a sudden destruction, but we do not know when it will happen. It will occur in an instant and without warning, so they must be ready. The route to being ready is to always have faith in Jesus and not to turn to thoughts of doubt. In conclusion, 1 Thessalonians demonstrates that, at the time of writing and before, a particular Christology was being preached by a character known as Paul. In his letter, he described his Christology in the following manner. God the Father and Jesus the Lord, his Son, both reside in heaven. An abstract idea of a Holy Spirit exists in the ether. The Holy Spirit is something that can descend upon a person and affect their state of mind towards belief in God and Jesus if they let the Holy Spirit in. Jesus was presented to the earthly world in flesh, killed and raised back to life by God. This is a theological metaphor being used by Paul to explain that humans, being mere flesh, can also be raised from their death if they believe in the flesh and blood resurrection of Jesus. At a time in the very near future, God is going to deliver wrath onto the earth. Before he does, he is going to send his son Jesus to earth with all his saints to collect the believers in Christ and the dead in Christ to take them back to heaven to live with Jesus and the Father for eternity. Those who do not believe in Christ and the resurrection will be left behind to suffer the wrath. Paul's message is, the wrath is imminent, so do not lose your faith and be left behind on earth at the time of the rapture. From the commentary in the letter, all we can determine is that, at the time of writing, this was a belief system active all over modern day Greece, but we cannot determine how many followers existed in that large geographical area. If we attempt to date the letter without influence from the four canonical Gospels or Acts of the Apostles, which is how the letter should be dated, we find that there is no information contained in the letter that will allow us to confirm a date. So the letter could be post-26 Common Era, but equally it could be pre-26 Common Era, Neither position can be determined or excluded by using the text within the letter. This is all we can determine from the very first extant Christian document we possess. No locations, no time frames, no characters, verifiable historic characters, no biography, no storyline, no miracles, no trinity, no teachings or sayings. These items were all added later, post-70 Common Era, into stories of Jesus by other later authors, not by Paul. Consider also the observation that, at some date prior to 70 Common Era, Paul writes a letter that contains no sayings or teachings of Jesus, or any sayings and teachings that Paul attributes to Jesus. But it does contain advice directly from Paul, that Paul does not attribute to the preachings of Jesus, notably 5.15. See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Why would Paul not indicate that this was a teaching of Jesus, if scenario A were a valid scenario? Galatia in 50 Common Era was a Roman province in central Turkey. Paul's letter to the Galatians is dated by scholars to 50 Common Era and exists in Papyrus 46 written circa 200 Common Era. The letter also exists in full in the 330 to 360 Common Era Codex Sinaiticus. These are the only two extant copies of the text. Therefore, like 1 Thessalonians, there is a significant gap of some 150 years minimum from the writing of the original to the writing of the oldest surviving copy. However, with regard to the consensus date of 50 Common Era, this again is arrived at solely by reference to the contents of Acts of the Apostles.
Therefore, like 1 Thessalonians and all of Paul's letters, this is a flawed method to use for dating purposes because it accepts, without question, the timestamp attributed to Paul by the anonymous authors of Acts as correct. There is nothing in the letter to Galatians itself which can be used to pin down an exact date. Therefore, if we set aside the consensus dating method, pre and post 26 common era, the start of Pontius Pilate's prefecture, are both possible. In Galatians 1.4, after the customary opening, the purpose of Paul's Jesus Christ is extended from rescuing us from the wrath that is coming and resurrecting from death to demonstrate that all can be resurrected from death, as in 1 Thessalonians, to include dying to absorb our sin. Paul says, who gave himself for our sins to set us free from the present evil age. There are two points of interest here. There is opportunity at this point for Paul to indicate who crucified Jesus and when, but he fails to take the opportunity, or could not because scenario B is in play. And Paul once again makes a reference to an age, and he uses the same word eternity derived from eon in the same manner as with age in 1 Corinthians. This is quite telling evidence that when Paul says in 1 Corinthians that the rulers of this age killed Jesus, he is not referring to the present rulers at the time of writing, but to unidentified past rulers from the present evil age, the age here on earth as opposed to the age to come in the kingdom of heaven after the impending wrath of God has been delivered. This also adds weight to the argument that the entry in 1 Thessalonians 2:14 to 15 because you too suffered the same thing from your own countrymen as they in fact did from the Jews who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, is an interpolation because it is mutually exclusive to the claim in 1 Corinthians. Given this, it is an apt time to highlight again the question, why would a scribe need to make such an interpolation? In 1.6 we find that, at the time that Paul writes, there is more than one Christology being promoted in Galatia, central Turkey. So two Christologies at the very least, and possibly more. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Recall that gospel means, to Paul, the good news about Jesus. Multiple Christologies in the early 1st century common era strongly favours scenario B over scenario A. The existence of multiple Christologies before 26 common era would prove scenario B and disprove scenario A, and there is nothing in 1 Thessalonians or this epistle to the Galatians that can be used to firmly date stamp the letters either side of 26 common era. We have to be mindful of the devastating implications to powerful worldwide organised Christian institutions, the Vatican et al, that would ensue if Paul was writing pre-26 Common Era, and that this undesirable proposition has been a chief driver in the dating of Paul's letters by mainstream scholarship over the centuries. If Paul's Jesus is a mythical demigod from antiquity, there could well be many versions of the myth, as there is with Mithra or Mithras. But if Paul's Jesus is the scenario A Jesus, and Paul does write circa 50, there is very little time span inside which such divergence of the story could have happened, particularly as the canonical Gospels come 20 years later, post 70, and are in general agreement with each other on the main headline story. In Galatians 1.11, the possibilities for scenario B extend exponentially. For what I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was proclaimed by me is not of human origin, for I did not receive it from a human source, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, the first thing we need to deal with is the obvious elephant in the room. The fact that Paul says he communicated with an apparition of Jesus does not mean Paul communicated with an apparition of Jesus, any more than a person who says they saw the Loch Ness monster in Loch Ness actually saw a monster in Loch Ness. People can and do make things up to receive attention. That addressed, we need to consider why Paul says this, 
It comes immediately after the comment on other preachers preaching another Jesus story. Paul is saying, do not listen to them. My Jesus story comes direct from Jesus. It therefore has superiority and authenticity, and the others are simply making stuff up. Paul then admits that, prior to his claimed apparition, he was a zealous Jew and persecuted the idea of the Church of God and Jesus. This is followed by a passage that is, in all honesty, the strongest evidence for a scenario A Jesus, but it is not conclusive and only one positive for a scenario A among a multitude of negatives. In Galatians 1.18 we have, Then after three years I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and stayed with him fifteen days, but I did not see any other apostle, except James, the Lord's brother. The literal translation would be, the brother of Lord. Professor Bart Ehrman forwards this item as one of his two key facts that Jesus existed. Jesus had a blood relative brother called James and Paul states that he met him. Dr. Richard Carrier argues differently. He claims the reference is a term of position in the church family, not a term of blood family relationship. Carrier argues that Cephas and the others are apostles, those who claim to have seen Jesus and have been authorised as apostles. James, on the other hand, is simply a brother, one who has not seen Jesus but has been baptised in Christ. Both arguments are fully feasible, but only one, or neither, can be correct. In Galatians 3.1 we have, It was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly exhibited as executed. But what can Paul possibly mean by this when considering scenario A? Galatia is in central Turkey. The dead body of the scenario A. Jesus did not leave Jerusalem and could not possibly have been seen post-execution by the people of Galatia. This reference must be being made in a mythical vision sense, not a literal historical sense. And in addition, the whole of chapter 3 is spent explaining that the law, Jewish temple law, was replaced by faith upon the arrival of Jesus. This gives Paul the opportunity of an entire chapter to indicate exactly when Jesus did arrive. But again, Paul fails to give any indication that he is specifically referring to the scenario A. Jesus. The same opportunities are passed up by Paul in chapter 4. In Galatians 4.4 we have, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son. Why does Paul not simply say when that time was? And then we have, born of a woman, born under the law. Why does Paul not simply say, born to Mary, born under the law? It reads as though Paul does not know the scenario A. Jesus story. Now consider the same statements with the scenario B. Jesus in mind. When we do this, the ambiguity of Paul's comments disappear and the comments start to make perfect sense. The rest of the letter, the main body of Galatians, deals with concerns between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians and particularly with the need to be circumcised, which Paul believes is no longer required for either Jews or Gentiles who wish to worship Paul's version of God and Jesus. As with 1 Thessalonians there is no mention of any scenario A locations, time frames, characters, verifiable historical characters, biography, storyline, miracles, trinity, teachings or sayings, and no information on which to date the letter. Pre or post 26 Common Era are both still possibilities. In this letter Paul informs us that there are already apostles in Jerusalem before Paul's conversion, Paul became an apostle in Damascus, he then went to Arabia for an unspecified duration, he went back to Damascus for an unspecified duration. After three years he went to Jerusalem and met with Cephas and James. He went to Syria for an unspecified duration. He went to Cilicia for an unspecified duration. After 14 years he went back to Jerusalem. He met Peter in Antioch. From this we can ascertain at least 17 years, and probably not much longer, for Paul's evangelising activities from starting to preach in Damascus to writing his last letter. Next in the consensus timeline comes 1 Corinthians, dated to circa 53 to 54. 
The three oldest extant copies are a full copy in P46 from circa 200 which contains most of the Pauline letters, a partial copy in P15 from circa 250 that is thought to have once contained all of the Pauline letters but now only contains 1 Corinthians 7.18 through to 8.4 and a full copy in the Codex Sinaiticus circa 330 to 360. So once again we have a gap of around 150 years between the suggested date of origin and the first full copy that exists. First we should return to the comments made by Paul in 2.8. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had they would have not have crucified the Lord of Glory. I have already commented on the Jewish belief at the turn of the Common Era that there were two ages. There was the present age here on earth ruled by the evil ones and the age to come in the Kingdom of Heaven and that Paul would be making reference to the past evil rulers from the present eon or eternity which has lasted since the creation of the earth. This comment becomes even more interesting when set alongside the beliefs of a Gnostic sect given the name of Sethians. This sect believed that the evil rulers or archons of the present age were the cosmological allies of the wicked demiurge called Yaldabaoth. Yaldabaoth was a lesser god to the supreme god known as the Good. Yaldabaoth created the world and humans without authority from the Good and the world was seen by the Good as a wicked creation. In this theology Yaldabaoth is the god of the Jews, Yahweh. The connection that makes this Gnostic dualist theology interesting is that in a Gnostic text titled The Second Treatise of the Great Seth we find the exact same concept that is espoused by Paul in 1 Corinthians. The treatise explains how the rulers of the age, present age, being Yaldabaoth's cosmic allies, are seeking to crucify the Christ. So, does the author of the second treatise of the great Seth plagiarise Paul's work, or is Paul a Sethian Gnostic? Or more probably, a Gnostic Christian following a very similar but slightly different Gnostic Christology to that of the Sethians. In chapter 9 there is an entry that adds considerable weight to Dr Richard Carrier's argument over the meaning of James brother of Lord in Galatians. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.1 Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Consider this to be Paul's understanding of the term apostle, a person who has seen an apparition of Jesus or in reality a person who claims to have seen an apparition of Jesus. Later in chapter 9 Paul says, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord. This would seem to be a strong indication that an apostle has the distinction of having been visited by an apparition of Jesus, while brother of Lord is a term given to a follower who has accepted baptism and follows Jesus. Given this, Dr Carrier's argument on James brother of Lord now seems far more convincing than Professor Bar Ehrman's argument and this was the strongest scenario A argument which now appears to be extremely weak. In chapter 10 Paul indicates that he harbours thoughts of his Christ being present spiritually at the time of Moses and the wandering in the desert. Our ancestors were all baptised under Moses for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of those did. Recall that in Galatians 4.4 Paul said, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son. So Paul's Jesus would seem to have visited earth during the timeline of the Jewish Moses stories. This is consistent with some Gnostic Christian theologies and also with an apocryphal work titled The Epistle of Barnabas which places Jesus at the time of Moses witnessing his followers worshipping a graven image of a bull. And for the Gospel of John much earlier, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. For the post-70 Common Era Synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark and Luke, such thoughts on the time frame of Christ are not compatible. They seem to worship a very different, much later Jesus. For this to be possible, we would have to consider that Matthew, Mark and Luke are plagiarising earlier myth. 
At chapter 1016 and 1123, there is a good example of Paul's Jesus being scenario B and the baseline of Paul's Jesus being taken, as in plagiarised, by the later writers of the four canonical Gospels, who expand and enhance Paul's narrative to create a supposed scenario A Jesus. It involves the Eucharist. 1016. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? 1123. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There is nothing new or unusual in what Paul says here for the time period in which Paul writes. Other demigods of the time had their own Eucharist rituals. The Eucharist of Mithras is confirmed to us in a polemic against paganism and Christian heresy written by Justin Martyr circa 150. But notice that in Paul's narrative he makes no mention of the detailed Last Supper event from the canonical Gospels. This is because Paul is not making reference to that Last Supper event. It is because the authors of the canonical Gospels are creating a full story around the origins of Paul's explanation of the Jesus Eucharist ritual. This is also the first time and the only time that Paul's Jesus is reported by Paul to have actually said something and he does not say a great deal. Moreover, Paul is indicating that it was said personally to him during a one-to-one -one apparition of Jesus. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Paul is not suggesting that the words were delivered by a scenario A, physical Jesus, preaching to a live audience. So the narrative Paul gives to Jesus here is very different to the narrative placed into the mouth of the Jesus of the Gospels by the writers of the Gospels. Basically, Paul's Jesus is completely silent publicly throughout all of Paul's letters, while the Gospel Jesus conducts a wealth of direct oral communication to his many followers. Chapter 15 is quite long and full of interesting comparisons to be made. First we have an item that has already been discussed while reviewing Galatians, but it is beneficial to recap the item here because it adds clarity to the items that follow. 15.3-8 for I handed on to you as of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. First to note is that Paul says, according to the scriptures. He must be referring to Jewish Messianic scripture from the 6th century BCE exile period, because the New Testament scripture has not yet been conceived of, let alone written down. As already explained while reviewing Galatians, Paul does not indicate that the death and resurrection was recent and that the appearances immediately followed. The passage can read as, the death and resurrection are ancient metaphorical events and the appearances are recent. This interpretation is actually confirmed a little later in the chapter. In 1615 there is an interesting comment that conflicts with a comment in an apocryphal work. You know that members of the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus. This remark creates the impression that the worship of the Christian religion in Corinth in Achaia began in Paul's lifetime. Paul describes Stephanus as one of the first converts and Paul is meeting Stephanus. Therefore, Paul lived at the same time as one of the first converts in Achaia. But we do not know Paul's age or the age of Stephanus. In a work called the First Epistle of Clement, the title here is misleading because the letter is anonymous, 
the author refers to the church in Corinth as being ancient at the time that the author writes. This conflicts with Paul's comments. The Christian church in Corinth cannot be both brand new and ancient in the same time period. One of the authors would seem to be incorrect. However, the first to convert does not have to mean convert to Christianity. It can mean one of the first to accept Paul's good news about Jesus, Paul's apocalyptic message of the coming wrath in our lifetime. Judged in this manner, the people of Corinth could have already been Christians following a version of a Christology that had existed for quite some time, and hence the following comment found in the first epistle of Clement, 47.6 Disgraceful, brethren, yea, very disgraceful it is, and unworthy of the conduct which is in Christ, that it should be reported that the most firm and ancient church of the Corinthians hath, on account of one or two persons, made sedition against its presbyters. 1 Corinthians is quite large, and much of the document has not been reviewed here. Only the items relevant to determining Paul's view of his Jesus character with regard to scenario A or scenario B have been discussed. The rest of the letter is mostly rules as laid down by Paul and a great deal of theological banter. Of extreme significance is the information that does not appear. As with 1 Thessalonians and Galatians there is no mention of any scenario A locations, time frames, characters, biography, storyline, miracles, trinity, teachings or sayings and no information with which to date the letter. Therefore, after reviewing the first three Christian documents we know to have existed, an origin date of pre or post 26 common era is still possible for all three documents, but with a hint of a possibility of pre 26, and there is still no clear view of the scenario A Jesus. This concludes part three of a six-part presentation on the chronological evolution of Christ which has critiqued the early letters of Paul. In part four I will critique Paul's later letters and conclude the review from parts three and four by offering a realistic date for the activities of Paul, a date which is pre-26 common era. Parts four to six of this presentation will also be posted to my YouTube channel Notori UK so please do visit the channel and subscribe to be notified of when they arrive.